everybody can hear me. So good afternoon to everybody who's watching with us here and also on um, Hairdresser Journal and Professional Beauty's Facebook. Um, I've got three lovely ladies with me for the next 30 minutes. So let's start going around our virtual room. So we have um, Chief Executive of the NHBF, that's the National Hair and Beauty Federation's Hilary Hall. Um, Co-founder and Managing Director of Richard Ward Hair and Metro Spa, that's Helen Ward. And then um, Managing Director of Essence PR and also current President of the Hair and Beauty Charity, um, Sam Grocup with us. Um, and we're going to be talking, I'm going to be talking to the ladies um, about kind of different aspects. But one of the things that Hilary particularly is going to focus on is what to do if you're falling through the gaps in terms of financial support. Then talking to, um, uh, to um, Helen about some real advice um, and what she's done and practice she's put in. And then also we want to talk to you with Sam and the three of us, because we're all trustees of the charity, um, about how the charity is helping both the hair and beauty industries and potentially what the industries can do to help the charity. So I think, would that be a fair assumption? Was that a fair intro, ladies? Would that be a good start? Yeah. So if we start with you, Hilary, um, I mean, the NHBF have been phenomenal in sharing advice and particularly the government advice and not getting into speculation and rumour. We saw so much of this at the end of last week, which is just unnecessary and actually causes all sorts of angst for people, which is just unfair. Um, so could you give us an overview of what's available and what, what people can currently get through the government, the government schemes? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jane, for, for the invite. So I'm not going to go into loads of depth and um, detail, just the headlines of what's available and what people have found useful. One of the things that I think is really useful that was only published uh, by the government last week is a link that takes you through. It's like a questionnaire approach and it takes you through um, a number of questions. And at the end of it, it will tell you, we think you could be entitled to this, this, this and this. Um, so I have sent the link uh, for that to uh, HJ and PB, and I know they're going to search yeah. that uh, afterwards. But that's a really good starting point because it's more specific to uh, what you can get. So I'm just going to talk very briefly about business rates because what we're hearing um, from our members is that the cash grants that are related to business rates have been probably the quickest and the most useful to come through. Um, so, in a nutshell, uh, if you're paying uh, business rates of less than £51,000, you can get grants of up to £25,000. And even if you don't pay business rates at all, because you're exempt uh, as a small business and you get the, uh, the, the relief, you can still get £10,000. And we're hearing something like 80% of, of the members that uh, we asked about that have already had those grants come through. Um, and that's not just England, but Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. So that's been an immediate cash boost, which has been enormously helpful. Um, there's some new news out today about rent and uh, evictions. I know some people, um, you know, have negotiated successfully with their landlords uh, about rent holidays. Um, but today there's been announced that there's a temporary ban on statutory demands and winding up petitions. Now, I can't give you details on those, but keep an eye open for our daily update because there's more information in there. So if you're really having problems uh, with your landlord, have a look at that because that gives you protection uh, against evictions. Um, quick word on chair renting. Um, you know, chair renters uh, and uh, room renters still have uh, rent to pay. And obviously at this time, it's very difficult for them uh, to do that. So we're encouraging both sides, the renters and the salon owners, to be really flexible about this. You know, we were talking just before the call started about uh, whether there'd be a big rush of people coming back into salons. We, we think there will be. And um, consequently, you need all the people that are renting uh, rooms to be available and willing to work and, and therefore being flexible about paying back uh, rent, which is going to be very hard to do if it was all in one uh, big lump. Um, so another area to look at, uh, business interruption loans. We've had much more mixed feedback about this. Uh, I think it was something like 13% of our members uh, who applied for a business loan have actually got one. These are the interest-free government-backed uh, loans. Um, they have softened the requirements a bit so that you can now uh, get a loan of less than £250,000 
without having to have uh, a personal guarantee. But nevertheless, we feel and, and are hearing that banks have uh, dragged their feet on that. Um, a lot of you will be self-employed, so I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the self-employed income support scheme. This is a scheme that gives you 80% uh, of your average monthly profits, and that's profits, not earnings, um, based on the last three years tax returns. Um, and I think a lot of people put out warnings that the tax returns that should have been in at the end of January, there was an extension on those, um, giving them till uh, the 23rd of April, which of course is now gone. So uh, there was an extension to get a tax return in. And the reason that's important is that to qualify for this grant, you must have filed a tax return for 2018-19. That's the one that was due on the 31st of, of January. Um, there's a list of criteria, uh, which I'll very briefly go through. You must have uh, traded in 2019-20. In other words, you, you've done some trading in this financial year and you would have been trading if it hadn't been for coronavirus. If you don't have three years of tax returns, it is possible still to apply as long as you've got that one year um, because the government will work on an average. Uh, it's better to have three years because particularly with a new business, you know, income and profits can go up and down. A lot of new businesses won't make a, a profit at all. You must have half of your income coming from self-employment uh, and your trading profit must be less than £50,000. Now, unfortunately, this scheme doesn't open until uh, June. It will be available through HMRC. So for self-employed people in the meantime, there's uh, universal credit and advance payments are uh, apparently being paid through quite rapidly or the coronavirus business interruption scheme. Uh, you don't have to apply for that um, uh, money to come through, the, the self-employment income support scheme. Because HMRC know who you are because you filed tax returns, they say that they will contact self-employed people automatically and then uh, pay the money straight into your um, bank accounts. And just a word on salon owners who are directors of limited companies, you're not eligible for the self-employment income support scheme but you could be eligible for the job retention scheme. So I'm just gonna cover very briefly the uh, job retention scheme. This is the scheme that uh, everybody now talks about furloughing employees. You know, essentially furloughing employees means that you're keeping them on the payroll, even though they're not working for your salon. Now that scheme opened last week and a lot of people um, have already put uh, their claims in and some people have uh, even had their uh, uh, money through. The other two links that I've sent to HJ and Professional Beauty are uh, one is to a step by step government guide that tells you how to apply, um, and the other one is an online calculator. And both of those are really useful tools, and a lot of people who've used them have said that actually it was a, a surprisingly easy um, application process. I do just want to say a quick word about commissions. There's been a lot of uh, toing and froing on this. When the scheme was first announced, um, commissions of any sort were not accepted. Um, but the latest advice is that commissions can be covered. There are conditions and I'll come on to that. But there's two ways of claiming uh, under the job retention scheme. If you're paying the same amount uh, through each period, you don't need to use the varied pay calculation. But if the pay varies, which if people are getting commissions, it will do, you need to use the varied pay calculation. And that is all covered in, uh, in the government guide. So the advice that we've had about, well, what kinds of commissions can you include is it's, it's called non-discretionary commission payments. And so, of course, that's sort of, well, what does that mean? So our legal advisors have said that if it's commission that is expressly included in an employment contract, um, then you can claim for them. But if those commissions are target related, you need to take uh, advice from HMRC. And as quite often with these things, sometimes it depends on who you speak to as to what answer we get. Um, 
but look out for that one. We put out a, um, an update on this last uh, Friday, Friday just gone, um, and there's a link in there to uh, HMRC. So just a couple more notes about furloughed employees. They have the same rights that they've always had. So statutory, sick pay, maternity rights, other parental rights, uh, all of those continue uh, whilst, uh, whilst they're furloughed. And holiday entitlements also build up uh, whilst em uh, employees are on furlough. Um, so holidays can be carried forward and the government have relaxed uh, the arrangements on that. So up to four weeks holiday can be carried across to the next two uh, holiday years. I think the big thing to remember about furlough is that employees can't do any work for you. They can't do any activities that generate revenue or that um, provide a service to you or, or, or the salon. And I know that's frustrating, um, but that's the rules. And I'm, I'm sorry to say that also applies if you are a director of a limited company and you furloughed yourself in order to be able to uh, access the job retention scheme. And I know, I know that's not popular and we are talking to government about it. Um, but I think it's just worth pointing that out. Yeah, sorry, I was just going to say, whistle <laughs> Yeah. No, can I just ask, because one of the questions we've had previously um, has been around, if you're furloughed, can you still train? Can you undertake training? And obviously, hairdressers are very active, particularly hairdressers and beauty therapists are active on social media. Can they still do posts to keep their business and themselves in the kind of the mind's eye of their customer? It's more clear cut for employees than it is for directors of companies. Employees cannot do work uh, for you whilst they're uh, furloughed if it generates uh, revenue or, or provides a service. Um, so volunteering is OK. Um, training, there are particular issues relating to uh, apprentices. And, and it's really worth reading the detail through on, on, on that. That is all covered in our blogs. There are FAQs around apprentices uh, and training. It gets more complicated with directors on furlough if they're uh, if they furloughed themselves and can't therefore generate income. So that could be things like selling gift vouchers or retail um, or providing services. And you know, our advice would be that social media would fall under that category because you know it, it, it is providing a, a, a service. So a, a tough one and a really unpopular answer. So Sh Shannon Fisher has asked that she's only been self-employed for a year. Will she still be able to get anything in June, even though she hasn't submitted? Um, so, no, I mean, these are a, a group that do fall through the, 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 the cracks. People who are recently self-employed, if you haven't got that one year's worth of uh, tax returns, your options are limited and it probably comes down to universal credit. Have a look at the calculator in case there are other things there that you might uh, qualify for. And I know that we've posted in the chat in the room and the team are also posting on our Facebook pages all of those links that you've supplied, Hilary, and you. being used. Um, one other question on that, um, and actually we did kind of mention it, touched on it at the beginning, and Helen, this will affect you too. Um, Kerry Cornish is saying, is there any gravity in the claims that the salons will have at least another six months before we open? I think we're all agreed that there is no ruling from government as yet about when salons were open, whether it's going to be six days, six weeks or whatever. And those headlines just need to be ignored as much as possible because they cause angst and further upset. Yeah, they do. Completely agree. They do indeed. And I so, think the only thing that is sure with this whole thing is that nothing is <laughs> nothing is sure and nothing is certain. And, you know, this is just something that is changing all the time. So, yeah, those headlines are very unhelpful. However, everyone, I would advise, should have some sort of plan in place because, you know, it's to think that we will, we will just be able to start to trade like that is naive uh, you know we need to plan this through we need to work out what we need to do we are working on a 3,000 page document about how we get back to work you know what do we do what do we do with our barman what do we do with the bar do we close it do, do we let clients wait in the same place you know all of the nuts and bolts need a real lot of thought so by all means you know, make your plans, go through with that thought, but, but obviously the only thing we do know is that we don't know anything. 
<laughs> and I think, and I think it's true. And I think when you look at all the countries around the world that are unlocking, actually the rules in each country have all been slightly different. Um, one question that's come up, um, Hilary, it's probably for you, it's JC, and I know he's from Guy Kramer, JC Olcamp. Um, are we still allowed to sell clients retail products? And I know, you know, this... It, it, it all comes down to uh, whether directors have furloughed themselves. So if if you if you were if you were not furloughed, and lots of company directors are not, so they're still working, and you can do whatever you want. It's just if you are claiming under the government's job retention scheme, so therefore you furloughed yourself so that you can claim uh, through PAYE, then there are limitations. But if you're not a director, that pays yourself a bit of PAYE and you know, probably takes some um, uh, dividends, but are claiming uh, through the job retention scheme. It's only that group you know, that, that it applies to. So if you're furloughed, then there are restrictions. And so a lot of people are saying, actually, this is so restricting, I would rather not take the, uh, the, the um, job retention scheme cash and you know, leave myself free to trade how I want. So we've had um, a lady called Suzanne Jennings has said in response to you, Hillary, with employees on furlough, one of her therapists loves posting on Instagram and Facebook different products. Can she do this if clients then contact the salon to buy them? She does the email to the clients promoting products, but she's self-employed, so is assuming that's okay. So I'm assuming by that she's not furloughed, the owner. If the owner isn't followed, they can do whatever they want. And, you know, it's a great time to be working on, on their business. It's only if people are furloughed and claiming money through the scheme that you need to be careful. Hope that answers the question. Yeah, no, it does. And interesting, someone's asking about PPE. Um, obviously, we don't have any guidelines from the government as yet on PPE. But I think it would be unlikely that the industry is not going to have to return with some sort of distancing, whatever that maybe someone saying if I'm self-employed and renting a chair it, I take it it's their their own responsibility to have their own PPE or would that fall under the salon I mean I suppose it's difficult because we don't know what the guidelines are are you asking me yeah yeah um yeah salon owners do have a responsibility for health and safety for the salon as a whole um and it's always a tricky area as to how much control salon owners have over people who are renting a uh, space or a room or a chair in, in in their salons um but you know particularly in this kind of situation if restrictions are introduced it makes sense that everybody works to the same ones you know it wouldn't make sense to have you know different people having uh, different kinds of um restrictions in in place i agree with you i think restrictions are going to be the new normal but you know like we said earlier until we've got the government advice we don't know what those restrictions are there's loads and loads of discussion about how effective different kinds of PPE are and whether PPE should be you know, reserved for the NHS. So, you know, again, it, it's very hard to speculate at, at, at this stage about exactly what would be required. OK, OK. Um, it's interesting, we're getting lots of comments about um, PPE. In one of the chat, uh, Gail is saying, I'm a self-employed hairdresser in a high risk group and petrified of starting work. She said, I can't wear full PPE to work. So what do you see happening? I mean, I, I think it's really difficult. These are all very relevant questions, but I think it's very difficult for any of us to, to answer them at this stage when we don't know what the government's going to say for the UK. And also yeah. there's lots of chats that, that I've sort of um, seen going on online about do we charge clients for the PPE that we have to um, now uh, have in stock so that they can come yeah. into us? Uh, uh, someone in New York was saying that they put a surcharge on the bill, um, a 5% surcharge, to pay for all the PPE. Yeah. So, you know, that's, I don't know, that's not a good look for me. I mean, it's not fair no. that we have to protect them or we have to protect our staff. Um, I certainly yeah. would be very, very scared to charge for it. But, that, but, you know, these are the real things. It's all very well with the law and the red tape. But the real thing is that's going to cost us and who's going to pay for it? Yeah. But would you not think no, that the customers would come wearing their own anyway? Or do you think when they get in, they have to replace what they've been wearing? Or I suppose, again, no, it, you know, so, I mean, I think it's uh, difficult to it's, speculate. It's mm. so hard to speculate. And I, I'm most concerned about spa. You know, I mean, that is such close contact work. 
And, you know, we've got to protect the staff and the clients, but, you know, uh, there, there's, there's so much to think about. I mean, this is, this is like, brilliant for your 3 a.m. How am I going to keep myself <laughs> awake tonight? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is true. And I, I kind of that brings us on to um, one, one of the topics we wanted to cover, which was around the charity and actually those people that are falling through the gap, Hilary, you're right, there is a group and we've had questions on here already from some of those people. Do we think, before we talk about the charity, is the government, obviously the government is aware, do you think there's anything they're going to do to be able to address that or not? There has been uh, pressure from, from different um, bodies ab ab about uh, improving what's available. Um, I... I wouldn't be too optimistic uh, about this. I, mean, you know, I, I don't know how many billions they've, they've poured into it. Um, and certainly when we've been talking about um, directors of, of companies, you know, the response we're getting is, well, look, we've given loads of, of, of help. So I, I wouldn't be too sure that there's any more going to be coming from the government. However, yeah. I think yeah. going back to restrictions, um, I, I think the government, they've already extended several schemes. The furlough scheme was extended until the end of June, for example. I, I think they recognise they will have to extend the existing help if um, you know salons or, or any other businesses can't, uh, can't reopen. So I think they're probably more focused on that. And I think we've had a question from Leah Durrant. Hello, Leah, um, saying businesses will suffer in terms of costing as PPE, but also that there's a, there seems to be an expectation that salons will have to operate at a lower capacity than their normal capacity rates to ensure distancing. Yeah, so and the worst, maybe having... exactly, Jane. The worst thing about that is, you know, you're still going to have all, all your costs. So, uh, you know, if, if you can't work at full tilt, but you're still having to pay your full rent and your rates and electricity and service charges and everything else, that, that's going to be really tough. So I don't know what they, I mean, I think the government actually have been fantastic. You know, we, uh, we accessed our funds yes, uh, yesterday and we had payday two weeks ago. Okay. So they've, they've been very, very fast and they've been amazing. Unfortunately, we, we can't get a grant with our, the rent that we have to pay. But, you know, I've heard lots of lots of grants that have come very, very fast. But, you know, what they do about the how we work when we've got all of our costs, but not all of our trade that we need to pay those costs, that is the thing that keeps me awake at night. Well, I'll just add that to the list, shall I? <laughs> do, you, do you think, do you think, Helen, that that you would have to look at extending opening hours, doing shift patterns, if that is the ruling? Absolutely. And we have actually also had to decide for the first time that we will probably have to open on Sundays. Um, right. I, I just don't see okay. how else we can. We're going to have to go from eight to eight. We're going to have to do shifts, and then who goes back to work first? And then you know, is it yeah. how can we do you and the service? I mean. It, it's a minefield and it's you're not just going to be able to find out at the end of one week that yes okay lockdown's over we can all go back to work put the key in the door and everything's just going back to normal this is going to take yeah. planning beyond anything i mean you know yeah. we, it's just, every time you think you've thought of everything then you think of three more things that you haven't thought about so like even how we walk our gowns disposable gowns we have to increase uh the heat that we wash our gowns on, the, the temperature, you know, it, it's everything, everything that there's so much to think about and it's, it's, it's tough. Yeah. No, I get that. Um, it's a lot of the questions actually for all those people listening in will be answered in the guides and the links that Hillary shared. So there was a question around um, if my head, if one of my staff is furloughed, can they work elsewhere? They can't work, can they, Hillary? But they can volunteer. Yes, um, and they can take another job uh, else, elsewhere. Um, it, it seems bizarre, yeah. but they can, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but obviously no, no salon. But not for the salon, salon. yeah. It's definitely yeah. not open, so not for the salon, yeah. no, absolutely. Yeah. So one thing that the FRAS, or one of many things that we all have in common, is our um, commitment to the Hair and Beauty Charity. Um, was known as the Hairdressers Benevolent, but has recently relaunched as the Hair and Beauty Charity. And mainly because actually we are we are caring for and looking after people across both both markets um so you've got three trustees on here and our current president in sam um i think we've seen lots of kind of those short-term 
requests for help where people are potentially falling through the gaps. But Sam, I don't know if you want to kind of expand on what the work the charity has been doing. Yeah, um, so we, you know, I, I don't know how many of the of the people involved today or watching and, and listening in are aware of the charity, but the charity actually was established in 1853. So we've been, we've got a very long heritage of sort of supporting the industry. So we look after um, hairdressers and beauticians who've fallen on hard times. Um, and obviously this is a very key time for us. Um, normally we would be sort of probably helping anything. We probably get applications for about say 12 to 15 a month we're sort of getting that on a weekly basis at the moment so there is a big need for this um, sort of help that the charity sort of um, been doing um, you'll probably see that in the media there's been a lot of talk about charities um, sort of really sort of suffering at the moment because obviously you know money is tight um, we can also we can't fundraise at the moment there's, we're not able to sort of do our usual communications that we do um, just today, or actually yesterday, the London Marathon was supposed to happen. So they actually kick-started a national campaign yesterday called the 2.6 Challenge, which you might have seen on social media. It's been in the news and it's going to happen all of this week. And they're just trying to encourage people to remember the smaller charities. So we know where everyone's been doing some amazing things for the NHS. There's been, you know, huge amounts of fundraising happening. But obviously some of our sort of core charities have also been sort of not, not sort of thought about at that time. So this is what that 2.6 Challenge is about. So for us as a charity, we're sort of asking people to get involved and sort of you know have some fun do some um, great things that evolved around this charity um, initiative from the London Marathon um, but ultimately what as you know you were just saying Jane is that each week you know we all get together we're doing our, our zoom conference calls and sort of looking about how we can help people in the industry so there is a huge amount of people that we're finding are falling through those cracks they may not actually be aware of the support that they're able to get this is one of the reasons why we decided to do this webinar today is because what we were finding is people who are coming to the charity for help actually have potentially got the opportunity to get help from the government so with what Hillary has just been telling you about and the links that they put on there you know that will definitely help but at the same time there is still a huge amount of people that can't get that help and that's what we're there but we're their lifeline so um, you know, and that's what we wanted people to know that, that you do have a charity. There is somewhere else to go if you need some help. Yeah, and I think it's been actually heartwarming to see the people that we've helped, but also the people that are helping the charity now and because of the situation we're in with COVID-19. Um, thank you for that, Sam. Hilary, if I can just come back to you. Um, oh. some, Joanne Sheridan's asked, or you may know Helen or Sam, can you apply again for furlough payment as time goes on or is it a one-off? My understanding, you can add people to furlough as the situation oh. progresses. The minimum requirement is that people have to be furloughed for three weeks. So you, you can't sort of yeah. furlough them for a week or two, take them off and then put them back on for uh, another week. And we're hearing, you know, quite a lot of people, a lot of companies are doing different things with furlough. Um, people who, you know, they're, they're furloughing some of their staff for uh, three weeks and then bringing them back and putting others on. Not quite the same with salons uh, where, you know, everyone's uh, shut. Um, but the, the, the thing is, uh, it is a three week period as, as a minimum. So uh, you can't do less and you can't sort of part furlough somebody. Um, even if they work part time, what you can't do is have them furloughed for some of the time and then not furloughed uh, for the for, for the rest. It, they're either furloughed or they're not. OK. And this one's probably for you, Helen. Lucy Johnson, do salons need to rethink their services to reduce the amount of time spent with clients to a minimum? It's an interesting. Absolutely. I mean, I think we have to rethink everything, sadly. I mean, one of the things I've just read here that Gavin wrote down was telling clients they can't come in with their kids or they can't move guests, you know, because, because we just cannot risk it. So the thing is, I think we just have to, the, the whole shift work thing and how we, how we work all this out is going to be a logistical nightmare but we're going to have to think of everything um it i, I it, it it's really having to start from from scratch isn't it? it it's really having to start from scratch and go okay what can we do um there are certain treatments that already put to mind that i think well we just we just can't do that anymore and will we when will that 
come back again? Will there be a time when, when we can start doing that again? And and at the moment, I would say no. There's, I've gone through my prices and literally put a red line through half of it. Because you don't think you'll be able to offer those treatments? I just don't think we will. Some of them are so invasive. You know, they're so close. I just don't think we can. Not if we want to protect our staff as well. You know, it's not just about the clients, it's about the staff, mm. isn't it? So I just think yeah, we have to be teams. very, very pared down, very pared down, and, you know, put a line through half of the things that we do, do the things that we can. Um, but I think you, you said at the start, Jane, it's it's kind of confidence, and that's going to take a lot. You know, all this talk about, you know, we're going to be round, it's going to be so busy. Yeah. I just don't think, I think I think we will, but for every client that is desperate to come back, there'll also be someone that is desperate to stay away. And, I, and we have to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think there will be two. I definitely think there'll be two camps. And um, I mean, Andrew Mulvena raises an interesting point, And he was saying, as we're, you know, for those that salon em employed directors that have been claiming furlough, that actually once you potentially in May or when we know we're going to reopen, then disengage yourself from furlough so that you can come back to work and start mm -hmm. planning and being seen to be putting your business forward. Do you know what I mean? I think I'm right it's, in saying though that you you can conduct you, you know you well you're the right one to answer this but you can conduct some of your job role because you know if we if we want to get our staff paid then we've got to work out their payroll we've got to do those things so I don't think there's there's too much of a, a need to go I can't do anything you know we're going to have to do some work behind the yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right, Helen. And I should have I should have said that there are statutory duties that directors have to do, uh, and one of them, as you say, is running payroll, you know, VAT returns, tax returns, you know, those kinds of uh, of, of things um, directors have to do. And it's not unreasonable either to expect them to keep an eye on their premises, um, you know, they're, they're un unoccupied. Yeah, you're, you're right. It's the non-statutory duties that uh, are causing the problem on on furlough. That are causing the yeah. difficulties. And um, I mean, an interesting comment somebody's made. What if a salon owner asks them to go back, but they're not going to follow the peop any kind of distancing protocols? I mean, to me, that is just abhorrent. You can't ask teams to come back and not follow whatever protocols have been set in place. Absolutely right. Yeah. To me, that yeah, that you know, if a business owner isn't being responsible and taking the precautions uh, that that they need to, um, you can understand why an employee would be reluctant to uh, to come back. Um, that would be the case to you know take advice. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Environmental well, the, guidelines are going to change, you know, as well. I mean, all of that rule book, you know, that. We're going to rewrite that as well. So, uh, you know, I think that that, that uh, lots is going to change. And if, if someone, I wouldn't want to work for someone who who didn't care about me. No, 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 a absolutely not. And, and, well, and that raises a more question about you where you work. <laughs> yeah, and as a customer, you wouldn't want to be going into a salon that didn't have. Uh, whether it's a beauty salon or a hair salon, it didn't have something in place either. So, as you say, that it doesn't make any sense to, from a staffing point of view, for a business point of view. No, and I think because we're coming to the end of our time. So, but Harry Cole says, please also remember your apprentices, especially those about to complete or take their um, EPA, which is very true, isn't it? Because they're also they're delayed. Yeah, yeah, they are. They are. Yeah, yeah. Really, really tough. The, those um, endpoint assessments can't be done virtually. Um, so there is a statement that's come out from all of the awarding organisations um, about that. Um, and there's a consultation as well. If anybody's training provider around this, it's only just been launched. So worth keeping an eye open for that, too. But, yeah, it's really I tough. Apprentices. I think we should be here all afternoon because there's loads of great questions and I think what we will try and do, if that's all right, we will try and get answers for people, maybe for a general piece that we can post on PB and Hairdressers Journal, um, just to give answers to the specifics, if that's all right with you ladies. But interesting, Sue Callahan said, do you think we'll see freelance hairdressers return to work before salons open? I hadn't. 
Well, I think according to the Sunday Times, yes. Yeah. Well, as I was saying in um, in Spain, my, my sister's a hairdresser in Spain, and um, they've basically been told they're not allowed to open the salons, but they can go in to do home hairdressing. So, you know, um, but as you know, my sister's customers actually have said they don't want her to come in at the moment. So, you know, so it's 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 a bit of a strange one. I think each it's going to have to be a very much we've just said, we're just going to have to wait and see really what. What we comes out? What the government says. When, when, yeah, yeah, when right we talk to uh, government, we have mentioned this because you know there, there, it, it's a fine balance, isn't it, um, over what control um, there are over people who are going in, in and out of other people's homes, or perhaps in and out of care homes. Um, you know, what kind of um, safety restrictions are in place? Because really, they should be. Uh, everybody should be working to the same. Uh, restrictions because it's it's all about not not only protecting your own safety but that of your clients and the general public. None of us want to be here back again, locked down in a year's time, do we? No. No, definitely, not. definitely. Not. Thank you so so much. We could go on all afternoon because we're getting loads mm. of questions still. But as I say, we'll try and pull something together um, across the PB and HJ so that we can share. If that's all right, I will we'll come to you to get those questions. Some are very specific, and I'm not sure we'll have the answers because until government tell us. What's going to happen? We have to wait like everybody else. Um, but thank you to everybody who's been sending in questions and listening to us. Um, please don't forget the Hair and Beauty Charity. I think, you know, it, it, the charity does phenomenal work for those in need. And it isn't just about now. We have long term help where people can't work through illness or injury um, all genuinely through no fault of their own. So um, I am the worst person to be on that committee because I think I would we all want around this table we all want to help everybody so um it doesn't seem right not to help them <laughs> um so please 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 keep in touch with the charity and thank you so thank you Hillary thank you Helen thank, thank you, you Sam Thanks. thank you guys, take care and stay safe bye bye, bye everyone bye.